A microbe madness driven by a relatively small number of people has gripped the world. Fear of an unseen enemy, like fear of terrorism, has caused worldwide anxiety, panic, irrational acts, pain, suffering, death, and destruction. Yet throughout history there are many times where the medical establishment and public officials supported ideas that were ultimately proven to be absurd. Their steadfast belief in their so-called settled science of the time has caused unimaginable misery and death. In the 1800s into the early 1900s, women outside of social and emotional standards were believed to suffer from a psychological disorder called hysteria. Textbooks and journals of the time brought scientific legitimacy and support for this invented mental disorder. For example, Dr. John Webster wrote about hysteria in his textbook, Diseases of Women, published in 1898. He described those suffering from hysteria as being easily excited, deceitful, having poor judgment, and having perverted sexual emotions such as abnormal yearnings for love. Dr. Joseph Collins, a professor of nervous and mental diseases in the New York Postgraduate Medical School and a visiting physician to the New York City Hospital, mixes in the then popular concept of eugenics. In scientific sounding terminology, he claims that Jews were especially predisposed to hysteria as well as other hereditary, degenerative, and nervous diseases. Dr. Charles Fox considered that women were almost the only ones afflicted with hysteria because of their emotional nature and their inferior reasoning abilities. The mainstream press also reported on hysteria. Husbands who suffered from the hysterical woman used popular home treatments such as dumping a bucket of water on their head of the so-called patient or locking the patient in a room while calling on the nearest pretty girl. These home remedies were considered effective in treating women suffering from this mental condition. People labeled with hysteria could be committed to a lunatic asylum. Their medically sanctioned treatments were essentially various different forms of torture. Restraints of all types were adopted simply to subdue and quiet patients. An 1885 report shows the dreadful conditions in New York asylums endured by those labeled as suffering from hysteria. Imagine that in this box bed a woman lived naked for 43 years. Can anyone imagine the untold suffering this woman went through because of an established medical theory? One of the treatments for hysteria was the hysterectomy, a surgical procedure to remove all or part of a woman's uterus. The term hysterectomy comes from the notion that women suffered from this disease because of their uterus. Therefore, the medical solution was to cut it out. How many women were mutilated to supposedly cure a disease of the uterus? Remember, this was a widely considered uh, to be settled science. Another scientifically popular notion of the time was eugenics. Eugenicists believed that society could be improved by controlling the population's genetic composition by eliminating the so-called undesirable elements. If individuals considered imbeciles could reproduce, the government was encouraged to intervene using forced sterilization. The science of the time held that mental defects were undesirable, and therefore the state had a duty to take any action to prevent the propagation of those defective genes. From a psychiatric point of view, Dr. Surin Babington considered that mental defectives were insane. He saw them as a threat to race betterment because, left unchecked, they would continue to have mentally defective children. Eugenicists believed that eugenics was a lofty form of patriotism and a tool to improve the human race by genetically selecting and eliminating delinquents and defectives. In 1922, Dr. Harry Laughlin, eugenics associate in the psychopathic laboratory of the Municipal Court of Chicago, eugenics director of the Carnegie Institution of Washington, wrote eugenical sterilization in the United States. Eugenicists promoted and pushed for laws to sterilize anyone they viewed as the genetic defects in society. State governments established medical boards to decide who was to be sterilized. That board determined if a person was likely to have children who would inherit idiocy, insanity, feeble-mindedness, or be predisposed to criminality. New Jersey passed a law in April 1911 that called for the creation of a medical board to determine who should be sterilized. Tens of thousands of people believed by the United States government to be unfit were sterilized. By 1933, state-sponsored sterilizations of people reached over 30,000. 
Again, this was a medically sanctioned procedure enacted by states in the United States of America. Absolute government power was taken to an even greater extreme with the rise of Nazi power in the early 1900s. It is estimated that in the first years of the Nazi regime, approximately a quarter million people were forced to be sterilized to improve the human race. Sterilization was performed because of hereditary feeble-mindedness, schizophrenia, manic-depressive psychosis, epilepsy, Huntington's chorea, hereditary deafness and blindness, as well as genetically transmitted bodily malformations. Who would be sterilized was determined by so-called hereditary health courts. The Germans bestowed an honorary doctorate to Harry Laughlin in 1936 for his eugenic sterilization work. Although the Germans implemented sterilization on a larger scale, the idea of sterilization of the unfit individual had its roots in the United States and Scandinavian countries. This idea of racial purity started because a handful of so-called scientists decided that it was true. Now, this may seem primitive and sane today, but then it was widely believed. The German regime took the idea of sterilization of the so-called defective to an appalling conclusion. However, the horrific impact of the visual and mass media coverage of the Nazi Holocaust camps at the end of World War II largely dislodged eugenics as a widely accepted practice. State control faded, but only after many people had been terrorized for decades. After the atrocities of World War II came to light, eugenics and oppressive actions taken by the government for the so-called public good lost popular support, and its history quickly vanished from the collective public memory. The practice of sterilizations continued with more restrictive uses into the Nixon administration. Even as late as 1970, there was increased Medicaid funding for sterilizations. Four sterilizations finally breathed its last in Oregon in 1981. Imagine that this insanity continued into the 1980s. We think today because we have more advanced technology, we are somehow so much smarter today, are we? Over the last decades, other destructive medical and governmental beliefs have caused countless suffering and death. DES, diethyl sebesterol, thalidomide, fenfen, viox, swine flu vaccine, the opioid epidemic, and others are examples of a medical and governmental system gone wrong. Many think that the medical system is incredible and flawless, is it? A paper in 2000 in the Journal of the American Medical Association showed that 225,000 people died from the medical system. In 2010, the Department of Health and Human Services Inspector General reported that up to 180,000 Medicare patients alone died a year from medical errors. In 2013, a study in the Journal of Patient Saf Safety estimated that 210 to 440,000 deaths a year could be attributed to medical error in hospitals. In 2016, a study by John Hopkins showed that more than 250,000 people died from medical error. A 2013 paper in the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics showed that 2.7 million hospitalized Americans each year have experienced a serious adverse reaction. Of all hospitalized patients, 0.32% died due to ADRs, adverse drug reactions, which means that an estimated 128,000 hospitalized patients died annually, matching stroke as the fourth leading cause of death death and serious reactions outside of hospitals would significantly increase the totals. An analysis conducted in 2011 based on a year of ADRs reported to the FDA came to a similar conclusion. Americans experienced 2.1 million serious injuries including 128,000 patient deaths. Over the last 20 years as many as 5 million using a base of 250,000 deaths or 8 million people if you use a base of 400,000 deaths in the United States died from the medical system. The total number of dead in the United States from wars from the Revolutionary War to the present is close to 2.8 million. So the number of Americans dead from the medical system in the last 20 years is 1.8 to th almost three times more than all Americans that have died in all wars combined. So I have to ask, where is the outcry? Where are all the medical organizations, the media, and the politicians who are continuously scaring you about COVID, telling you about these reports that show the medical system is killing hundreds of thousands of people each year just in the United States? The silence is deafening. 
And examining public data makes it clear that death from diseases such as measles, scarlet fever, whooping cough, and others declined without vaccines or antibiotics. Measles declined by over 98 to nearly 100% before the vaccine. Whooping cough fell by 90 to 98% before a vaccine. The improved health of people in society is what was instrumental in the decline of deaths. All the mortality data show this. The germ theory has been mainly proven false. The terrain theory, or the health of the people, has ultimately been shown to be true. Yet this 1800s concept of germs killing anyone and everyone has remained entrenched with a massively, highly profitable medical system built around it. The answer today is always the same. More drugs, more vaccines. Still today, many blindly listen to today's experts without ever considering they could be just as wrong as the experts of the past. Studies keep showing that medicine is the third leading cause of death. The decline in infectious disease deaths was because of improved health, not primarily the medical system. Yet there is still a totally blind trust in this system that is almost always automatically deferred to to any questions of health. Is it really deserved? As unbelievable as it may seem, governments are grabbing power based on the say-so of this fundamentally untrustworthy system. Governments are radically shifting from servants of the people to their absolute rulers. The extremes governments are taking uh, as actions for supposedly the public good are on par with the eugenic sterilizations of the past. In Australia, the government has resorted to actions that were unthinkable only a short while ago. $5,000 fine for a quarantine breach, $3,000 fine for exercise rule breach. Police threaten to use a whole range of health orders against citizens who don't obey. Closing businesses that don't follow orders. You must apply for a permit to even travel. A single person only may travel if the government considers it essential business. Fines for people out without a reasonable excuse. Roadblocks to ensure people comply with government orders. Arresting people who don't comply with any health order, protest, or even visit friends. Arresting, handcuffing, and fining teenagers a thousand dollars who are at a beach. Imprisoning people in their homes. People are forbidden from going to work. Police go into people's homes arresting pregnant mothers in their pajamas for the crime of posting something negative about the government on Facebook requiring some people to put signs on their doors marking them as potentially having COVID. Police with full riot gear shooting into crowds with rubber bullets and pepper ball pellets seriously injuring people. 24,000 17 year olds were ushered into an arena for mass injections where some children collapsed and reportedly two died. Talks of going to all schools and injecting all children. Children are dragged to get injected using pepper spray and tear gas on citizens police terrorizing, tackling, dragging, and subduing protesters. Protesting is outlawed. Weddings are illegal. No gathering of any size. Having police helicopters fly overhead threatening people. Using the military to threaten citizens. Always having to carry identification, QR code check-ins, and vaccination records everywhere. Police checking phones for vaccination status. Australian troops deployed on the border of the states to check for their papers, fining people for not having all their papers in order, not letting loved ones visit their dying family members, having to travel further for emergency hospital care, radically restricting travel to only five kilometers, fining for violating. Masks are required to be worn even outdoors, huge fines for not wearing one. Children's parks are closed, being told not to talk to anyone anywhere callously shooting and killing rescue dogs so volunteers won't go and adopt them, not being allowed to go watch a sunset, not being allowed to get sunshine even if it provides vitamin D and other health benefits, building large multi-bed quarantine concentration camps, tips to crime stoppers for people attending church, continuous and unapologetic scaremongering. In Australia, any pretense of democracy has been obliterated. Australia has turned into a draconian, authoritarian, police, medical, totalitarian state that does not care about the mental torment, financial destruction, increased suicides, any adverse effects of their extremist measures, or if anything they are doing is remotely logical or scientific. 
Imagine you were a teenager who just wanted to hang out with friends. Instead, you are terrorized, handcuffed, and then having to explain to your parents, who might already be financially struggling, about a $1,000 fine. All this for the unspeakable crime of meeting at a beach with friends. What if one or more of them commit suicide? What if these teens suffer permanent psychological problems? What if they are abused or worse at home? Will these public so-called health officials care? Imagine being arrested for the other unspeakable crime of posting something on Facebook. Police barge in and arrest you in front of your no doubt crying children. Imagine peacefully protesting when the police in full riot gear threaten you with military weapons, spray you with pepper spray, and fire bullets into your crowd. The myth that has been propagated is that anyone and everyone can be killed by this virus. But in fact, nearly 95% of people hospitalized had at least one underlying condition, high blood pressure, obesity, and others, and importantly, anxiety and fear. And obesity and fear increase the chance of death by 30%. I bet you didn't see that on television or being talked about by the so-called health experts. Fear, it's what the media and public officials have been pushing for months and months and months, 24-7, constant fear. So public officials are increasing hospitalizations and deaths by doing these extremist actions and causing massive amounts of fear and anxiety. These tactics are not only ineffective, they are resulting in the very thing they say they are preventing. While public officials are using terrorist-like tactics of enforcing lockdowns, masks, and the like, which have scientifically been shown to be making things worse, the key factors in improving health and outcomes are losing weight, gaining exercise, eating good food, getting plenty of sunshine, decreasing stress, the direct opposite of what these so-called health experts are doing. While empowering people to get far healthier and happier, it would also decrease hospitalizations from all respiratory conditions as well as massively reduce deaths from the biggest health killers on the planet, heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes. Making the world's population healthier would make an incredibly dramatic change from where we are without terrifying people and destroying people's freedoms. The key to all is your health. Not medications, not vaccines, 99.9% .9 of your health is in your hands, so take control of your life. And this insanity is based on a popular and highly profitable medical theory. All this panic and the resulting actions are based on a single PCR test, with cycle counts over 30 being utterly useless. And of course, 45 cycles are being used in Australia. Here are some excerpts from this paper. I urge people to read the entire paper. Quote, this paper will show numerous serious flaws in the original paper, the significance of which has led to worldwide misdiagnosis of infections attributed to SARS-CoV-2 and associated with the disease COVID-19. Validation ha was only done in regards to theoretical sequences and within the laboratory setting and not as required for in vitro diagnostics with isolated genomic viral RNA. This very fact hasn't changed even after 10 months of introduction of the test into routine diagnostics. A positive RT-PCR, real-time PCR, test merely indicates the presence of viral RNA molecules. The original test was not designed to detect a full-length virus, but only a fragment of the virus. We already concluded that this classifies the test as unsuitable as a diagnostic test for SARS virus infection. The number of amplification cycles, less than 35, preferably 25 to 30, in case of virus detection, greater than 35 cycles only detect signals which do not correlate with infectious virus as determined by isolation in cell culture. In light of our re-examination of the test protocol to identify SARS-CoV-2 described in the original paper, we have identified concerning errors and inherent fallacies which render the SARS-CoV-2 PCR test useless. As shocking as this is, it's important to repeat this test is unscientific and useless. PCR technology takes a fragment of RNA assembled by a computer that has never been verified as part of a virus. In fact, the virus has never truly been isolated. Please watch Dr. Sam Bailey's video on how unscientific it is 
that this test is being used to diagnose a disease. Perhaps the most important reason to learn history is so that the worst things are never repeated. The ability to choose what is injected into our bodies is now being removed by states and workplaces. Loss of religious exemptions once seemed impossible, but the stridency of the pro-vaccine and their so-called settled science is effectively working to remove all choice across the planet. How far will this insanity go? If the diagnosis of hysteria and eugenics is any guide, we are in for an increasingly bleak future of increasing destruction of individual rights and liberties. Thank you for your time. References and links are in the description below. If you found this information valuable, please share and like. If you agree or disagree with any portion of this video, please let me know.